So anyway, in Matthew chapter 24, I'll start in verse 4, and I'll end in verse 14. And uh, we should finish up this section. We're going to look at the last two verses in our study, but we'll, I'll read this whole portion from verse 4 to 14. And uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. I like that phrase, amen. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And the two verses that we're going to focus on tonight are these two, the last two verses in this section. <clears throat> but he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Let's pray. Father, again, bless your word, bless our time together uh, this evening, Lord. Uh, may you be honored and glorified. Father, we pray for uh, those who are on the way that they would safely get here, Lord God. We also pray, Father, for those who are not well, as they're staying home tonight, Lord God, be with them. And we also pray tonight, Lord God, that you would again touch the hearts and lives present and online, especially those who are lost, Lord God. May your will and way be accomplished in each and every life, and just, Lord, fill me, use me tonight to that end. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Praise God. Okay. So uh, just a quick little review. Um, as many of you know, as we've been going through this passage, um, I, I've, I, I've brought out some different things to help you understand that uh, this passage mainly deals with a future time, even though when you look at the list of things here that they are in, you know, you can look today and say, yes, there are wars, yes, rumors of wars, you know, we can go through this whole list as we've already done. Pestilence, oh, there's pestilence. Well, you can define COVID under that category, a pestilence, amen? So we're seeing some of that. But so what was, what was a really big help to help you understand is, and, and you got to go back to the previous lessons, is the phrase in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And basically what that's a reference to is the Lord kind of likened the tribulation time, the great tribulation, a seven-year time frame, um, to likened it to a woman going through labor pains. That's what he likened it unto. And so he said, in the beginning, as of course, if any woman can bear witness to this, pardon the pun, um, they can, you can, you know that when labor first onset, it, it's maybe not as hard. And then as it, as the, the labor progresses, the pains increase. Okay? So what you'll see is when we study that things get worse progressively in that time called the Great Tribulation. Um, we, we finished a study earlier this year. I mean, it's hard to believe here we are in November, amen, November 17th uh, tonight. Um, but we, we finished a study on Daniel, and I have message after message to help you understand. As a matter of fact, we'll review a little bit of that in verse 15 when we get there, Lord willing, next week, about the reference to Daniel. What does Daniel talk about? you know, um, this abomination of desolation. All you got to do is when Jesus mentions something, let's read, let's go back to the prophet Daniel, amen, and let's read what he had to say and find the reference, see what he has to say. And of course, the reference there is to this time of what's called Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, and this abomination of desolation taking place, which will happen in the middle of the tribulation time, in the midst of the week, Daniel chapter 9. We did a whole study on this. So we have all of this on YouTube that we've gone. If you want, if you want any direction as to uh, where to go, you know, for those in person, uh, just talk to me after the service or message me. I can direct you to where you should watch and listen, so you can get the preaching and teaching to help you, to bring you up to speed on these things. 
Because we've done a lot of preaching. I think, I don't know how many messages, I've lost track of count. But we got hundreds of messages online right now. And they're there to help people. They're there to get the gospel out, to get people, because my heart's burden, number one, is for people to be saved, amen? But my heart's burden after you're saved is for you to, to know the word of God, and hopefully through knowing the word of God, you will live the life that Christ wants you to live, and you'll also be able to help people. Help people in understanding the word of God and help people in living the truths of the Bible, Amen. And that's what we want. We just don't want a bunch of head knowledge here and say, oh, look how much I know here. Because even Paul in his letter to the Corinthian believers said, knowledge puffeth up. It lifts people up. They think, look how smart I am. Look at all of this. I understand and know. Wonderful, but are you living it? Are you living these truths in your life? Are you following through? Amen. Is uh, You know, people in this world, they must see the outworking of your knowledge, and, and knowledge is separate from having wisdom. Wisdom is the practical application of that knowledge. It's that outworking. That's what wisdom is. So when we read the books of wisdom in the Old Testament, Solomon, God used him to write those, amen? That's the practical outworking. How are we going to practical, you know, what kind of uh, uh, application can I make from this tonight, okay? So, so again, without going through all the study we've already done in Matthew 24, you need to go back, okay? So I've already covered this about, this is a reference to the first half of the tribulation, verses 4 through 14, even though you say, well, aren't these things happening? Yes, they are. But in the tribulation, they're going to happen in the greatest degree that you could ever imagine. As a matter of fact, a portion of Scripture that I've referenced over and over and over again to help you see this is a passage, let's see here, I have all my notes here from before, and I think it is, let's see here, we'll kind of find the passage that it's, okay, in Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 21, the Bible says, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. So the Lord says, the things that are going to take place, yes, maybe some of them we can look at and say, oh yeah, this happened, this happened. But he says, what is going to take place in this tribulation will be so great. When you study the book of Revelation, there's 21 judgments that that will be outpoured upon the earth. Can you imagine that? Boy, I'll tell you, if you're saved tonight, the Bible says you'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, taken out of here. Praise God. We won't be here, amen? But I feel my heart breaks for those who are lost, who don't know Jesus Christ, who are without the gospel tonight. And that's why I have, as much as possible, as pastor behind this pulpit, uh, four times a week, I try to stay focused on the Word of God. There's a lot of social issues I could preach about and talk about, you know, especially about COVID and everything else. But you need, here in-house and online, you need the Bible tonight. You need the Word of God. You don't need a repetition, a rehash of everything you've heard all week. Amen? So, so I, I, you know, the Bible says it's the perfecting of the saints. That's why God, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says he's given apostles and, and prophets and pastors and teachers. Why? To perfect. What's the perfecting? To build up, to, to mature the body. Amen? So God says he uses a minister. He uses a shepherd to help Christians to grow in their faith. Amen? So that's why it's important to be in, in, in house church. Amen? In-person services. But that will help you grow. It's one thing to look at a YouTube video. and you, You're listening, and that could help you. Not to say it wouldn't. Amen? But at the same time, you don't get that extra interaction. Once when I post that, that's it. It's just there. You can watch it. But it's important when you're with God's people that we can discuss these things. And, and we, can, we, can, we can, you know, if you've got questions, we can talk. We can, you know what I mean? So it's so helpful for us tonight. So, so when we look at these verses, I want you to think of a situation that is so bad, so terrible, that even from the creation of the earth, this earth has never seen it to this degree. Okay, and that's what you got to keep in mind. Yes, these things have been in place, but not like they're going to be in place. They're in a greater degree, okay? So that's just so important to make sure that you understand. What we looked at in the previous weeks, we saw issues of false Christ, false prophets, wars. We've read them in there. International discord in a greatest degree. You think there's discord tonight in our world. It'll be greater yet in that tribulation time. 
Amen. Um, we haven't talked about famines. Wow, great famines. So much so that it take a day's wages to pay for just a loaf of bread. How about that? How about you working all day just to have a loaf of bread? Amen. Boy, I tell you, talk about inflation like you've never seen before. You think the price of gas is high. How about that one? You work all day just to get a loaf of bread. I can't imagine what everything else is going to cost. You know, so, um, and people are going to be starving like, like we've never seen on planet Earth. Never. Pestilences, nothing compared to, you think, wow, this COVID is bad. And it is. It's not good. Amen. Uh, the, the people that have died in sickness and so forth, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't disregard that. But the reality is there'll be pestilences so great. We even read that a quarter of the earth in those first judgments that God uh, unleashes, a 25% of the earth's population will be wiped out. We were, we were reading some of that last week. Just think of that. 25% of the population will die because of these judgments that are being outpoured on the earth. Oh, I'm so glad I'm saved. If you're saved, you're part of the bride of Christ. We're his bride. He's the bridegroom. The bride will meet the bridegroom someday. We'll see him face to face. Praise God for that. I can't wait to see my Savior first of all, even as Fanny Crosby wrote. Amen. And uh, so, and there will be cosmic phenomena about the sun becoming black and the moon becoming like blood and all these things. I'm saying, well, you know, we've had these blood moons. Not like they're going to have in the tribulation time. Oh, boy, nothing, nothing compared to what's coming. Amen. And uh, so, so we kind of finished a lot of those characteristics in that first half. But then I left you at verse 13 because there is a bit of confusion uh, and a bit of misunderstanding that some people have because of certain phrases. One thing you need to remember, and let's look at this tonight, first of all, um, the phrase in verse 13, but he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Number one, we got to identify what does the word save mean there? Is this talking about, because the word saved is used in different ways in the Bible. One, the one way we're all familiar with, if you are saved, if you're born again, is that when someone trusts Christ, the Bible says you've been saved. But the word saved is also used in the Bible like we would use it in our world tonight. Oh, so-and-so, did you hear about so-and-so? They were saved from a car wreck. That means they were spared from dying. Okay, so there's references in the Bible that use it in that manner, okay? So you say, well, how do I know which way God is using this word saved, okay? Well, let me, let, let me show you here, okay? So first of all, let's look at some examples here as we look through this here, because again, we gotta understand, number one, what is salvation, okay? So let's look at what salvation is, and uh, then I'll give you some other examples. So in Ephesians chapter two, very familiar passage, for anybody who's been saved for any length of time, okay? So if someone is saved spiritually to go to heaven, to have a relationship with Christ because they endured something, that would seem to contradict what I'm about to show you because people are not saved spiritually by endurance. Look how they're saved. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 a, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You cannot be saved by your works. Enduring to the end would be indicative of your works. You know, the Bible says that when, when those who know Christ, those who have put their faith and trust in Christ, uh, let's say, you know, we, we are not alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, that some of us may be up in heaven someday before that day. Some of us, God's people may be alive unto that coming of Christ, amen? But he says the dead in Christ will rise first. Either way, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive remain will meet the Lord in the clouds. So when we get to heaven, there won't be anybody boasting. The verse here says, lest any man should boast. You can't boast of you, how good you were and that you earned a place in heaven or you earn this relationship. No, the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. It's grace. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Amen. Someone did this acronym, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E, Christ's 
Okay, are you ready? God's riches at Christ's expense. He paid for our sins. Amen? He took our place on the cross. So no one is in heaven singing, I got here because I was a good person or I was a member of a church or I was baptized. No, there's only one reason. As a matter of fact, we'll see some verses after. It's about Jesus. We're singing around the throne about Christ. We're praising him. We're not praising the people that are there and saying, oh, I'm so glad you were so righteous and holy that you earned your way here. No, no one will be there for that reason. The only reason anyone will ever be there is because of grace through faith. It's through faith. Did you put your faith and trust in Christ? I did so. Oh boy, tomorrow at 10.35 a.m., listen, I received Christ as my Savior 47 years ago. And the only reason why I know that date and the time is someone wrote it down. You say, I don't know the date and time when I got saved. Don't worry, as long as you remember what you did. Amen? That's all that matters. Tomorrow, 47 years. But it's as clear in my mind and my heart as the day I got saved. I am, listen, I, I'll tell you, there are no regrets. There are no regrets in getting saved and coming to know Christ. My wife got saved in 1979. She was a waitress. People in the church used to come after the evening service on Sunday nights and go visit this restaurant, the Falls Manor restaurant on Lundy's Lane. And they would go there, and they would give her gospel tracts. Then one time after her mom passed away, uh, the pastor and his wife showed up. They were on a date together, and uh, they, you know, she, my wife had a question. Where does your soul go when you die? Talk about an opener for someone. If you want to be a witness and witness to somebody, if someone said that to you, where does your soul go when you die? And you're a Christian, you better have an answer. Amen. You better be able to tell them how to come to know Christ the Savior. And she received Christ right on the job. It was quiet in the restaurant at that time. And she opened her heart to Jesus. And praise God, she saved. Amen. Oh, I'll tell you, never forget that day. Never forget that day. It was by grace through faith. Amen. In the finished work of the cross of Calvary, what Jesus did for us. He's the only one who could live that perfect life. You and I could never live the life that he lived. He was without sin, amen? As a matter of fact, the Bible says he became sin for us. He took our sins. They were put upon him, the sins of the whole world. He didn't deserve that, amen? I deserve to die for my sins, but Christ took my place. He took your place so that you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to spend an eternity in a place called hell. Oh, boy, what a great Savior. Hallelujah, what a great Savior. I like that song. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, I thank God I'm saved. Amen. There's only one reason. I ask people, you know, some people sometimes maybe say, oh, you know, I, I, I ask, you know, I say, oh, uh, do you know Christ the Savior? Or I might say also, you know, are you 100% certain if you took your last breath right now that you would be in heaven with the Lord? And they might say, yes, I, 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 I do. I, I believe I'm going there. Can you explain to me what took place in your life? Or how do you know this? How do you understand this? And I listen because I have a Bible in my hand or a New Testament, and I will listen to what they're saying. If they say, oh, I'm going to heaven because I was very good and I was baptized and I was a good father or a good person, I said, no, no, the Bible says there is none good, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? And I would show them Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I would show them that, listen, there's no way, there's no way you can save your own soul. Because if you could save your own soul, then ask, I got to ask this very important question. Why did Jesus come in the first place? If I could save myself, why why would, why would he even have to come here? He came here 2,000 years ago because you can't save your own soul. You need him. You need Christ. Like I like that on my little banner up there. <laughs> Amen. Jesus is the answer for the world today. He's still the answer even during COVID. He's still the answer. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. You know the instructions that Christ gave us, he says, get the gospel out. Those, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew and the end of Mark and the end of Luke and the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, amen, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He says, after that, you'll receive power. 
you know what? God gave us a commission. It's easy to get distracted by a lot of stuff going on social and news media, isn't it? It really is easy to get distracted, that we lose our focus as believers. There's people lost without Jesus Christ. They need to be born again. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus, a man who was a Pharisee who knew the Scriptures. Amen? Boy, I'll tell you, you say, I know the Bible. So did Nicodemus. And Jesus said to him, ye must be born again, Nicodemus. doesn't matter how much Bible you know. It's do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you know him? Do you know him as your personal Savior? That's the big question. So I said all that to tell you that the Bible's very clear. You cannot save your own soul. You cannot earn salvation because people would be boasting in heaven. So for someone to say, this is spiritual salvation, that the way you are saved is you got to endure to the end, that would be a contradiction to what I just shared with you. As a matter of fact, let me add one more verse in the mix. How about this? Titus 3, 5. I love this verse. This is a very powerful verse. There's so many passages, we won't look at them all, of course not. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says this very clearly, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, the Bible says. Watch, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You need to be regenerated. That's being born again. That's what Jesus was talking about with Nicodemus. He says, not by works of righteousness, Amen, which we have done. It's not your works of righteousness. You know what the Lord says about our righteousness? Over there in Isaiah, he says they're like filthy rags. All of our righteousness is as dirty, dirty rags in God's eyes. You think, I'm so righteous, Lord. I should be able to get there on my merits. And God says, that's like dirty rags to me. But if you put your trust in Christ, God sees his righteousness, Christ's righteousness. When you ask Christ to save you and realize I can't save myself and I deserve to die and pay the price for sin which was in hell and that God says, here, I'll impute, I'll take Christ's righteousness and I'll put it on you. So when God looks at me now and he looks at every believer the same way, he doesn't see Ken Parrott the same anymore. He sees Christ's righteousness because I believed on Jesus Christ, amen? Oh boy, thank God for that. Thank God for that. Wow, what a blessing. Amen? So let's, let's go back there to that Matthew chapter 24 passage. So the Bible says there, in that passage there, let's go, I, I, I lost my, there we go, verse 13. But he that, in, that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The same shall be saved. Okay? So we know this. It's understood um, that the Bible uses this word, saved as in the sense of salvation. We've already explained that. As a matter of fact, you say, can you show me another place? Keep your place in Matthew 24. You remember Luke chapter 6, or Acts chapter 16? Acts chapter 16. Do you remember good old uh, Paul and Silas? They're in jail. Why are they in jail? Because they preach the gospel. <laughs> they preach the gospel. That's why. You study New Testament. The reason why the apostles got themselves in trouble, the government says, you can't preach that here. And they said, well, we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5, 29. And they said, we're going to obey. By the way, you know, we ought to obey God rather than man. So, so, so I've heard some people quote that, that I knew we're not obeying God in other areas. Come on now. We need to obey God. Before you can claim that verse, he says, we ought to obey God rather than men. We need to not tell people that they need to obey God rather than men if we're not obeying God ourselves. But that's the way some people are. They like to quote that. Are you obeying God tonight? Okay, we ought to obey God rather than men. And they, they knew they would be persecuted. They knew they would be beaten. They knew they would be thrown in jail. Even as our brothers and sisters in Christ in some countries, in China, North Korea, amen, this dear pastor, I won't say his name, I cannot say his name, he's back here, praise God, he's home safely, came from China, oh, very close, oh boy, you, I'm telling you, it was hard, you say, you know what, 
Here we are in Canada. We have the freedom and liberty to get the gospel out, but are we using that liberty and freedom? Do we take it for granted that we have liberty and freedom to share the gospel with others? You know what? Some people say, you know what? If they ever took this freedom away, I, I would really, listen, why are you waiting for it to be taken away? Why don't you do something about it tonight? Why don't you tell people when God gives you opportunity to be a witness, tell them about Christ. Amen? What an opportunity. What an opportunity. So the Bible says, here they are in jail. Amen? In Acts chapter 16. They're in jail. Why? Because they preach the gospel. At verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Amen. You know what? They're in jail. They're there because they obeyed God. They're, they're, they preach the, the, script, the, the scriptures. They're preaching the gospel. <clears throat> they're in chains. It's at midnight. And the Bible says they're singing praises to God. Isn't that, wow, isn't that amazing? That, that, that just like, wow. Okay, if Ken Parrott was in jail for preaching the gospel, amen, would I be singing praises to God even at midnight? Maybe I'd be saying, woe is me, or like, oh, I don't know, I can't. It's even like the nation of Israel. They wouldn't sing the praises of God in Babylon, the Bible said. You remember that in the Old Testament? They wouldn't sing it. Listen, that's the time to sing when you're in Babylon. The people in Babylon need the Lord. You know, the Bible says if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, not to the ones who are saved. If you know Christ tonight, if you don't share the gospel, it's not going to, listen, it's not going to be, well, those people who are saved are going to be lost. No, you're already saved. But those who are lost don't know that. That's why we need to open our mouths. Even as in Acts chapter 8, you remember the Ethiopian man? You remember Stephen? Or not Stephen, but the Bible says um, uh, Philip, amen? He, was, he saw this man, the Ethiopian man. He was reading out of the book of Isaiah. He's reading some scripture. He says, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I except some man guide me? And the Bible says, that he came out and he talked to this man. He explained who that was. He was reading from Isaiah 53. It's a prophecy of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. What did he do? He gave him the gospel. He preached Christ. Amen. And the man got saved. <laughs> How about that? And Philip the evangelist, right after he got saved, the man says, now what would hinder me from getting baptized? He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He got saved. But he says this, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He says, if you're saved, you can be baptized. Baptism is an act of obedience after you're saved. Baptism doesn't save your soul. Salvation in Christ, you receive Christ. That's what saves your soul. Baptism is just a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's a profession of your faith that you're saved. Because churches that preach the gospel would never baptize somebody who hasn't made a public profession of their faith. Praise God, amen. He got baptized right there in that desert place. <laughs> Lord called him from a revival, amen, in Samaria to a desert place called Gaza. Does that sound familiar? That's still around today. Amen? Come on, I tell you, get look at these things. So anyway, good old Paul and Silas, they're singing praises at midnight. Amen? The prisoners heard them. Amen? The people in the jail should hear you praising God. Not com complaining and grumbling and murmuring. That's the last thing you want to do. You know what? God, if God, you end up in a place like that because you preach the gospel I, you say, you haven't experienced it. I know I haven't. I know the example of the Bible, of people in the Bible, and what they did. And that's what we need to do. You say, that would be, have to be very strong in Christ. You got that right. That means you must have spent a bit of time in the Word to help the Lord, to help you to strengthen your faith in Him. Amen? And they were bold. They weren't ashamed of the gospel. Even as Paul said to the Christians at Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. He said, I'm not ashamed. 
I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed to tell people about Jesus. Why would we be ashamed? Amen? And so as we get through this, you find out that there was an earthquake. It, the prison doors were open, verse 27. And then the keeper of the, the prison, back in those days, if your prisoner escaped, you died the death penalty because you're supposed to be watching these people. And he said, and he was about to kill himself because if they ran out and escaped out of the prison house, he knows he's going to die, so he's just going to do it himself. <laughs> hey, man, can you imagine? That's wow. And then the Bible says, Paul, he cried out in verse 28. He says, do thyself no harm, for we're all here. Don't worry, we're not taking off on you. We're not running away. 29, they called for a light, sprang in, came in trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas. You know what? There were some things that that man heard from Paul and Silas. And that testimony was so powerful that it would cause this man to come on his hands and knees before him. <laughs> Amen. And his life would be, he's looking like, Wow, like, what is this? Amen, what is this? And he says in verse 30, he brought him out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's like I said a few minutes ago. My wife said, where does your soul go when you die? That's how she came to Christ in 1979. Where does your soul? They said, what must I do to be saved? Now, if someone asked you that question, could you give them the gospel? Can you quote Scripture? Do you have enough Scripture memorized? The Bible tells us in Psalm 19, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Have you, hide it? have you hid God's word in your heart? Can you share enough Scripture? Oh, we know lots of information. We know phone numbers. We know passwords on your phone and on your devices and your computers. And oh boy, we know scores and numbers and everything under the sun. How about... Some scripture. Can you, can, could you give the gospel scripture by memory? Even without a Bible. Let's say you say, well, you know, if I had a Bible, amen, we got them. We still have the freedom and liberty to carry Bibles and hold Bibles and have Bibles in our homes. Can you understand something? That may not be a guaranteed freedom forever here, in, even in Canada. You say, are you trying to scare me? You know something I don't know. I'm just telling you many different places of the world where the gospel doesn't, uh, is not allowed to be preached freely. You get caught with a Bible, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. That's, that's like, that's illegal. You know? Boy, I tell you, I thank God I'm saved. So can you get the gospel out? Do you have enough understanding and knowledge to be able to share the gospel? You say, I don't know a lot of scripture. Can you share at least one scripture? How about this? You say, I'm... I, you know, I know how I got saved. Well, tell them, give them your testimony. Can you do that? Share how you came to Christ. Amen. I like that in John 9. They said, hey, uh, uh, tell us more about who, who healed you. You have that blindness. And they, they bothered his parents. He says, ask him. He's of age. He can talk to you. He's my son. He's old enough. Don't ask us. Ask him. Well, they were afraid of some things, of course, with the Pharisees. But when he went to the sun, he says, I don't know who he was, but all I know is this. I once was blind, and now I see. You can tell him that. He said, I'm, I was blind. You mean you're physically? No, spiritually blind. Bible says everybody's in darkness before they come to Christ. This world's in darkness tonight. You say, oh, it's, I know it's nighttime. You know, it's 10 to 8 right now. No, even in the brightest time of the day, the world's in darkness, and God's way of our understanding because they're without Jesus they're in darkness amen so the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ look at this verse 31 so the answer the question was well, sir what must I do to be saved verse 31 did they say endure to the end jailer is that what they said no, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way of salvation. It's by grace through faith. No other way. There's no other way to heaven. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You've got to go through Christ, putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Oh, boy. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. So let's look at some other passages here. So we know this. Go back to the passage in Matthew 24. 
So he that endure uh, shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So we know this, it can't be spiritual salvation because that would be a contradiction. And God is not confused tonight. The way people misinterpret the Bible, they make God look foolish because they cannot, they don't understand just simple te- uh, things of studying the Bible and reading the Bible, or what we would call in theological circles, hermeneutics. It's just Bible study. You just, I can pull a verse anywhere I want out of this book, and I could make it mean whatever I want if I take it out of its context. I could say, see, the Bible says you aren't saved until you endure to the end. But I'm not going to do that because I've read the Bible before. I've studied the passages. I've studied the word saved and how that it could be used in a sense that, like today, I was saved from a car wreck. (laughs) Amen? As opposed to, I'm saved, my soul has been saved from hell to heaven through Christ. Big difference. One is physical, one is spiritual. Okay? So, because we know this is not spiritual salvation, spiritually saved, It's got to do with physical. So what do you mean here, Pastor? I'm glad you asked me. Let me give you some more help here, okay? And we'll come to this verse in weeks down the road. Verse 20, look at, watch this. So verse 21, we've already read this tonight. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor ever shall be. Again, That's a tribulational passage. Everything that's going to take place, the 21 judgments that will fall, amen, that will be here in that time, which we're not, the church, the bride of Christ will not be present. He says, nothing, nothing, everything that's happened in the world up to this time is, can't even compare what's going to take place in that seven-year time frame. Verse 22, and except those days be short, there should, what, look, look at this, there should, what, no flesh be saved, He's not, see, the, the, the chapter itself explains what we just read in verse, uh, in verse 13. He's talking about flesh salvation. What's that? Staying alive. Listen, if you could stay alive in that tribulation time, it will be a miracle. Now, we know this, and again, without getting too much thoughts in the future and so forth in the book of Revelation, God is going to spare a remnant of the nation of Israel, and they will be protected. Some people think it's in that area called Petra. I don't know, maybe, possibly. I just know this. You know what God did to the nation of Israel during the wilderness, how he he took care of them, he fed them, he gave them water? God's going to do the same thing again for that remnant of God's people someday. He's going to take care of them. Amen? So he says, and again, remember Matthew What is the the emphasis in Matthew? To Jewish people. It has that Jewish flavor to it. Amen? Like, I don't have time to go to verse uh, 15 tonight or verse uh, 14, but that one talks about the gospel of the kingdom. To a Jew, they're so, listen, they were told there a Messiah would come who was Jesus, and they, they said, no, they rejected him. He's coming again, but as I've said so many times, he's coming as a lion, not as a lamb. He came as a lamb, amen, 2,000 years ago. If you're saved, you met him as a lamb, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, amen? And uh, so, um, but at the same time, praise God, these people, unfortunately, listen, you know what? When Christ came, they rejected him. He presented himself to them as king, amen? They rejected him. You say, but... Part of the plan of God was, yes, he would have to die for the sins of the world. It wasn't like, oh, they messed up on plan A, we'll have plan B. No, God always had the same plan. Amen, he's going to die. Christ would come, die on the cross. He just knew what people would do. God knows that. And then, as a result of that, now it's been 2,000 years. Amen, pretty close to 2,000 years. It would be 2030, would be 2,000 years since the death of Christ. You say, how come it's not 33? Because he was 33. And a, because the Roman calendar was off by four years. He was born in 4 BC, according to the Roman calendar. Amen. We did some of that study before. So, but you know what? He's coming back. 
They think, oh, no, no, he's coming back for the first time. No, 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 he's coming back for the second time. Amen? And actually, the event that we're going to be taken up in, that's a separate event. Amen? Unless they get saved, they won't be taken up with us. Amen? So they need to be saved. So, but they're in, God, you know, the Old Testament talked a lot about the kingdom age, the millennial kingdom. And Christ, the Messiah, would come and all that. So they were so focused on, hey, if he's the Messiah, how come the Romans are still have us have control of our land and us? How come that's not been taken care of? Because that's a while, long time later. <laughs> long time later. But anyway, so listen, we need to stop there. And Lord willing, next week, we'll pick it up in verse 14. We'll talk about the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, the gospel of the kingdom. And uh, for those who weren't able to catch, we got some folks that just arrived, amen, poor, they got stuck on the bridge. You'll have to watch. I think the song service was, might have been muted. Is that right? Maybe. That was good? Amen? Oh, really? Good. I wasn't sure. Praise the Lord. Amen. And, uh, but anyway, praise the Lord. Okay. Let's, uh, maybe we can get someone to stop. Maybe, Connor, you can go back there and stop the feed after I pray here. Father, again, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you for those who are able to come tonight. We know so many were stopped or hindered from coming tonight because of the problems on the bridge. Lord God, be with them, encourage them, keep them all safe. Now, Lord God, uh, as we take a few moments here of prayer, I pray, God, you would just again, uh, Lord God, just um, use us, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to get the gospel out. So many people, Lord God, need the truth of your word. Now bless and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen.